So I'm uh, Amish Deve. I'm one of the heart rhythm doctors at Methodist, and uh, we're going to talk about pacemakers and bradyarrhythmias. I have uh, basically one slide on bradyarrhythmias. Bradyarrhythmias, heart slow. Um, it's really less exciting than uh, what Dr. Ramy was talking about, uh, and actually a lot conceptually a lot easier uh, to deal with. Basically, uh, it can happen because there's a failure to initiate a, uh, a, a an impulse. Or it can happen because the impulse is initiated fine, but um, it doesn't conduct to where it's needed. Or it can be some combination. So by definition, bradyarrhythmia means the heart rate's less than 60. Uh, in uh, the first two of these five causes, sinus bradycardia or pauses, there's a failure to have a, an initiation of the impulse. In the last three, there's a failure uh, to conduct uh, that, that impulse. Sinoatrial block is, uh, is an interesting topic that you're probably not going to run into practically other than in, in board questions uh, during your fellowship. But uh, uh, it, it's hard to distinguish from sinus bradycardia or sinus pauses. The uh, EPs can distinguish uh, that. Um, it's a failure to get the impulse out of the SA node to the atrium. And you, it doesn't show up on the EKG. AV block is block at the at the AV node, of course, and infranodal block is block in the in the his Purkinje system. Um, and the symptoms are, are fairly straightforward. Uh, anyone through uh, residency would have seen these th types of things. Uh, the treatment is to stop the drugs that are causing it, uh, and or to give a pacemaker. Uh, there's not much else. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about pacemakers uh, for the rest of the talk. Pacemakers basically involve uh, the actual box of the pacemaker, uh, which has the battery and the computer, uh, and has a little header uh, where we plug in leads. And of course, the leads uh, here uh, on, on the right-hand side, we see uh, one of the fancier new leads that have four electrodes on it. Uh, but most of them have uh, two electrodes. Some of the older ones have only one. Each of those black points is an, a metal contact uh, for uh, the electrode to uh, make a connection with the heart muscle. Let's see. My okay. So pacemakers do two things. It's uh, really simple compared to what you've been hearing about. Uh, they pace or they sense um, or both. Well, let's talk about pacing. When we pace the heart, uh, we are trying to initiate an action potential. And uh, with uh, heart uh, muscle cells, that means we're trying to get phase zero of the action potential started. In the normal situation, in, uh, phase, in, in cardiomyocytes, your resting action potential, your resting uh, membrane potential is around negative 70, negative 60 uh, millivolts. And uh, something causes it to become a little bit depolarized to the point where sodium channels open up and you initiate phase zero and everything else takes over. With uh, pacemakers, we're trying to trigger the cells near to the electrode to enter into phase zero by actually injecting some current uh, into the surrounding tissues. If we use enough current, it works. If we use not enough current, you, it fails to uh, initiate an action potential. And there's some fancy stuff here that you don't have to memorize, but basically you can control a couple of parameters. You can control the voltage, uh, the duration th uh, uh, for which you apply that voltage, uh, and current. And, and current actually is determined by the, the voltage. So basically uh, in uh, general, if we apply a very minimal amount of voltage, no matter if it's applied over a whole year or, or a fraction of a millisecond, if it's below a certain number, it's not going to be enough to cause an, an action potential, cause a heartbeat. And uh, uh, that, uh, that, that's sort of the threshold uh, for capture. In general, uh, we can pace the atrium and the ventricle or both, uh, uh, and or the, the ventricle. Here you see an example where there's a pacer spike followed by P waves in each of these. And so we're atrial uh, pacing and there's successful capture with each of the pacing spikes. You should know that the pacing spikes uh, on the diagrams always show up beautifully. On the, um, in the ICU telemetries usually show up very nicely. And on EKGs in the clinic may not show up so nicely. And the reason for that has to do with the uh, way the pacemakers um, 
uh, deliver energy in general, the more uh, voltage you put out, the, uh, the bigger the pacing spike uh, artifact. Uh, and uh, the nature of the electrode, if it's a temporary wire, it's usually going to be a fairly big uh, pacer spike. If it's programmed unipolar, it's going to be a big uh, pacer spike. Um, so uh, ventricular capture uh, is going to give you a QRS. Uh, the QRS is going to have a, a specific morphology that depends on where in the ventricles you're pacing from. In this example, you can see uh, there's a, a bunch of pacing spikes. Each one is followed by a wide QRS, uh, and uh, there's AV dissociation with uh, P waves uh, visible. Ventricular loss of capture is important to know. Uh, this is all important even if you're not ever going to go into EP, never going to put in pacemakers, because you're going to take care of patients in the cardiac uh, ICU who have epicardial wires or, or, or temp wires that you're putting in in the cath lab. Uh, and, and you don't want to see this kind of stuff. Uh, here you have a, a PQRS, PQRS, uh, and then a pacing spike with nothing, PQRS. There's pacing spikes going throughout. Not one of them captures. Uh, you're probably programmed, I mean, you're definitely programmed below the capture threshold. Now, what determines the capture threshold are a number of things. It's how well you're screwed into the heart tissue or how well you're making contact with the heart tissue, the um, nature of the tissue that you're contacting, if it's dead meat, if it's scar uh, from a myocardial infarction or something, it's not going to work. The um, acidosis and various drugs also affect the, uh, the ability to capture. So you could have had a perfectly reasonable capture threshold and gone home and then they call you, it's not working anymore, and it could be that uh, any of those things changed, not just that the pacemaker lead moved. Here, it's a little bit more ominous. If you ever see this, this is a real problem. Uh, and so uh, here, this pace, patient seems to be uh, uh, dependent on the pacemaker. Uh, and here, uh, everywhere else, you can see a pacer spike. And whenever you do see a pacer spike, it is followed by a QRS. But there is no pacer spike here where there should have been one. Uh, that's ominous in that this is a failure of the pulse generator, of the logic in the pulse generator to put out a spike. Uh, it can happen for a variety of reasons, but at the end of the day, this is an unreliable pacing system that needs to be uh, fixed right away. Fusion beats, uh, sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, we get consults uh, periodically for uh, the, the EKG changing. Uh, with pace, uh, patients with pacers, um, what you find is if the pacer spike happens uh, at certain times, you'll get a fully widened QRS uh, that's characteristic, uh, and that's from full capture of the, of the ventricle from that uh, pacer spike. Uh, that's an example over here and, and over here, the first and sixth beats. But these beats are uh, narrower uh, than the fully captured beats, and the answer is, uh, the reason for that is there's an intrinsically conducted beat that's happening at the same time. In this case, uh, t and typically uh, patients in AFib. And uh, you don't know that uh, there's a QRS here other than you see this narrowing of the QRS. Uh, whoops. OK. So now we'll talk about sensing. Uh, sensing, you know, in general, the simplest way to pace uh, is to put a pacer wire in tell it, do not sense, close your eyes, and just put out a pacer spike of, of a certain strength and a certain duration, uh, and uh, just, that's it. Uh, and this is asynchronous pacing. In real life, you don't always want to do that. You don't usually want to do that. Uh, in, the, in the most cases, if a patient has their own heart rhythm, you want the pacemaker to get inhibited whenever the patient has their own QRS. So if a patient has AFib and they're just very slow, whenever they do manage to get their own uh, rhythm, you don't want to necessarily uh, pace right after their, their own QRS. There's risk to doing that in that you could pace just the right, the wrong time in repolarization and actually induce torsada or other problems. So here, uh, pacemakers can sense, uh, for the most part, uh, if they're programmed right, you can sense an intrinsic rhythm. You have some control over this. Uh, in general, there's a number which uh, you'll see on the reports and you'll, you'll have some control over it, and it's on the pacemaker box in, in, the, in the dials. And that's a sensitivity. And basically, the number is a number of millivolts. Any signal that the pacemaker senses that's larger than that number of millivolts will tell the pacemaker, don't pace. Just you know, uh, hold, hold off on, on putting out a spike. 
if it's set high, uh, that means you will miss uh, any uh, QRS complexes or P waves that result in a, in, a, in a signal that's less than that number. Uh, it also means that you'll miss the signal from the microwave oven turning on or, or something else uh, that's noise. If it's set very, very low, it means you may actually uh, inhibit pacing correctly whenever there's any P wave or, or QRS, but it also may be inhibited by the external noise sources from the patient's cell phone or something like that. So there's, uh, there's usually a correct uh, answer in terms of how to sense it, how to set the sensitivity. So uh, in this case, you see uh, that in this rhythm strip, you see a paced P wave and a, a conducted QRS, a paced P wave, a conducted QRS. And now there's a P wave that looks different from the other ones. It's different from the ones that are, that are preceded by pacing spikes in that there is no pacing spike and the morphology is different. This is a sinus P wave. And uh, what the pacemaker will do if it's not programmed to an asynchronous mode is it will reset its clock. Uh, internally, it's waiting one second if it's programmed 60 beats per minute. Uh, after each time it puts out a pacing spike or senses a P wave, uh, and here it senses a P wave, it's going to wait now one second after that, and the pacing spike will come over here. Uh, sorry. So, uh, same thing applies in the ventricle. Uh, if you have it programmed to uh, uh, produce a pacer spike every second, it will uh, pace here. You get a QRS. But if in the interim there is uh, uh, an intrinsic uh, QRS coming from the AV node or a PVC or something else, the pacemaker resets the clock, and you see the, uh, the, the next pacer spike comes one second after the previous QRS, not from the uh, previous pacer spike. Oversensing, if you're sensing too much uh, signals that you shouldn't be uh, sensing, if you've set the sensitivity too low or if there's a problem that's causing you to sense noise or if the patient is uh, close to uh, an arc welding machine or something like that, you, uh, you cause uh, lack of pacing. Oversensing means uh, less pacing. And so, for example, over here you see a pacer spike with a QRS uh, and then forget this circle, but you get a new pacer spike over here with a big QRS. You um, should have had a pacer spike over here, but you don't see it. Uh, and the reason is there's, there's, uh, it's sensing something uh, where it shouldn't be, where nothing exists. And so this should have been just a regular rhythm, but because it's not, uh, it, it, it's, there's something wrong. And the nature of, of the problem is that it's over sensing a signal that doesn't exist. Whoops. Undersensing is actually uh, also bad. Uh, in undersensing, there's a, an intrinsic QRS. The device is programmed uh, to be sensing and to be inhibiting, but here it clearly isn't. You see a pacer spike right after the QRS, uh, over here, here, here. This one actually captures right on the T wave, uh, right near the end of the T wave. And these are just uh, uh, normally paced beats. There should have been, uh, unless you know, this was programmed asynchronously, uh, sensing of these QRSs and reset, but there wasn't. So this is either ventricular under sensing or a pacemaker pr programmed uh, asynchronously to not sense at all. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is the last slide is really uh, the, the uh, codes that you hear about for pacemakers. This is oftentimes a source of confusion. Uh, there's uh, Three-letter acronyms that really get bothersome at times, but basically the ones you're going to see are DDD, uh, VVI, or VOO, or DOO. Anything that ends in O and O means you're asynchronous. You only have to pay attention to the first three components of the letters. Uh, the first letter is which chamber are we pacing? Uh, this is simple. If it's AOO, then you're pacing in the atrium. If, you're, if it's VOO, you're going to pace in the ventricle. If it's DOO, you're pacing in, the, in, the, in, the, in both. Um, so you can put in an atrial lead uh, and a ventricular lead and program a device uh, to pace in all, all, you know, both of those chambers. Just because you have both leads in doesn't mean you can't program the device to ignore pacing in the ventricle and just uh, program an AOO or, or VOO. Uh, 
so for, if someone says that the, the, if a rep says, hey, you know, the device is programmed uh, VVI, but you know that there's two leads, you're, you know that it's programmed to only paste in, in the one chamber, the ventricle. Uh, the second letter is, which chambers are you sensing from? Uh, it, again, if you're O, you're not sensing at all. You're programmed asynchronous. This is appropriate. If the patient is going to get electrocautery above the belly button in the area of the chest, you don't want it to pace. You want it to actually uh, uh, just close its eyes and ignore any electrocautery. You don't want it to sense. You do want it to pace. Uh, and then if you do sense, what do you want to do? Uh, so if you... In the typical situation, if you sense a QRS and you have a ventricular lead, you don't want to pace right out right away. You want to inhibit pacing. And so that's the typical VVI uh, uh, mode. Uh, the twist, the other mode you'll see most commonly other than VVI is DDD. What that means is a little bit more complicated, but basically you are in, in general going to do all of that, but if you want a QRS to follow every P wave. For example, in complete heart block, patient has sinus rhythm, you sense the P wave, you want to pace in the ventricle, you trigger pacing in the ventricle with a ventricular lead if you sense a P wave. So if you have a DDD mode, that's really basically a mode where you're going to try to recreate AV synchrony, recreate a normal rhythm as much as possible.